What's the word, y'all? We're continuing our series and talking about all 30 NBA teams leading up to the season. If you missed the videos, we're going through the Nets, the Heat, and the Knicks, and today we got the Pelicans. And I want to say right here, right now, I will not be spending multiple minutes talking about hypothetical Brandon Ingram trades. I feel like everything I've read or listened to when it came to the Pelicans offseason is like, hmm, Brandon Ingram is up for a trade. Uh, can he get traded to the Jazz for Walker Kessler? Well, he can't get traded to the Cavs because Jared Allen just signed his extension. I'm tired of it. And it's not too late, right? It's not too late for Brandon Ingram to get traded. Damian Lillard got traded on September 27th last year, right before camp. So there is a world where Brandon Ingram is not on this roster. But I'm going to just take the roster at face value. I think it's so much more fun to talk about what is there versus what could be there. So we'll be doing that today, okay? Leave a like, subscribe. Let's talk about the Pelicans. So boom, last season ends. Um, the guy in charge over there, VP of basketball operations, David Griffin, comes to the podium and said, hey, y'all, we're going to be making some major changes to this roster this offseason. And he didn't lie. They went out there and they acquired DeJounte Murray. They sent out Larry Dance Jr., EJ Liddell, Dyson Daniels, and the draft capital to bring DeJounte Murray in. And uh, we've talked about this a couple, a couple different times throughout the course of the last season and a half, but Trey Young and DeJounte Murray didn't mesh well. Trey Young even talks about it on his podcast, and they are too similar of players and people to really make it work on court. Both of these guys want the ball in their hands to create for themselves and for others. So it just wasn't the perfect match. When DeJounte Murray was traded for in the Atlanta Hawks, the idea was, oh, this guy was an all-defensive caliber player, a one-time all-star, and super, super young. We can have him play alongside Trey Young, guard the best players, and still provide some type of value. Well, it seemed like they were just better with one of them on the court versus both of them on the court. So they made the executive decision to get rid of DeJounte Murray. And the Pels acquiring them made so much sense. The Pels made some experiments in over the last couple of years where they acquired CJ McCollum. And I got to give CJ McCollum a lot of credit because this year he evolved his game so much. I think we'll talk about that later in the video. But he's not a point guard, right? He has not been a point guard again. He did a pretty good job trying to do that. But they needed a guy whose job was to get other, people's in, other people involved in, in, in DeJounte Murray is that. Now, there are flaws to that, right? I do believe that when I watched the Atlanta Hawks last season, specifically when Trey Young wasn't on the court, DeJounte Murray dribbled around a little bit too much, or he felt like he was only passing to assist. But I do believe even with those flaws and his point guard play, he is a big upgrade to that position for the Pelicans. And listen, again, DeJounte is very far away from the all-defensive caliber defender that we saw. And part of that, we've seen this a lot of times throughout NBA history where a guy makes his name known for a defensive caliber player, then his offensive game evolves, and now he's so much more taxed on offense that his defense falls out. Uh, DeJounte Murray is a gambler when it comes to steals and all of this stuff. But one thing about DeJounte Murray last year is that he was tied with Lou Dort when it comes to matchup difficulty. They were asking this man to guard the best player on the opposing team every single night. Well, now when he goes to the Pelicans, he's going to play alongside one of the, what, top five defenders in basketball? At least that's what the NBA decided last year in Herb Jones, where his matchup difficulty shouldn't be this high, which means that he won't be as taxed on one side of the court because his offense blow won't be as high because you think about all the other guys that are on the court. And his defense, like, he, if he's guarding the secondary ball handle, the second most important offensive player to a team, I think that he can hold some value defensively. And with Herb Jones being on the court... That's where you're going to get from DeJounte. And again, he wasn't amazing at the role of guarding the best player every single night. But if you're saying that he's got to guard the second best, I just feel like you can get him back to close. Uh, making him all defensive is going to be hard. Like, again, it's it's a mind shift shift and all of that. But getting him closer to a plus defender than he was last year is going to be extremely important for this Pelicans team. But also, DeJounte Murray, this is his averages. He shot 7.13s per game last season, and he shot about league average, which is amazing for him. Right. The few couple years before that, you know, you got five attempts on 34 percent. You got four attempts on 32 percent. He really has turned himself into a quality three point shooter. And a lot of that are not catch and shoot opportunities. Last year, he shot 39 percent on catch and shoot. That is that's pretty impressive for DeJounte Murray. Think about the player that he has been throughout the course of his career and having a player that can attempt nine threes a game and shoot 39 percent on catch and shoot is extremely important because the Pelicans are in a very, very unique position going into this season. Again, we're, we're saying that Brandon Ingram is on this roster, right? Think about every team's top two scores. You got the Boston Celtics have the Jays. You have the, the Denver Nuggets have J Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. You got LeBron and AD. You got so on and so forth. Well, the Pelicans were at the bottom of the league when it comes to their top two guys in three-point shot attempts. Brandon Ingram was at 3.9 per game, and then Zion doesn't shoot threes at all. So they, they had this lineup that was a really, really good three-point shooting team. This team was top five in three-point percentage. 
but bottom five and three point frequency. And again, DeJounte Murray coming in and adding seven point whatever three pointers per game is going to help that a lot because I am a firm believer at the year 2024, as stupid as it, is, as it is, you have to be able to shoot the three point ball effectively, which they do, and frequent in order to be a really good team in basketball. And they did this and they were still, what, a 50 win team last season? So imagine what they can be now that they have increased three-point volume. And Kenny, what are you talking about? Three, increased three-point value? Well, David Griffin was talking again, and we was listening. So this is what he said. We're really excited about this group as a whole, Griffin said. I know everybody thinks we should invest in the center position a little bit. We actually are really excited about what we have now. We're excited about getting to play small and fast. I think the coaching staff looks at the group we have as an opportunity to really grow. Whoa. That is uh, interest. That is very interesting. ESPN has their depth chart as this. DeJounte Murray, CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, Zion, and Eves Messi. I'm going to say there's a 2% chance this is their starting lineup when the season starts because everybody I've talked to that's ear to the ground is believing that Z is playing at the 5 position because you can't have Herb Jones come off the bench. Are you kidding me? You can have one of the five best defenders in basketball be a reserve? No. They are buying into playing small and fast a lot. And boy, is that an experiment, man. Is that, again, everybody wants to drop a Brandon Ingram for center trade, but David Griffin is saying, no, 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 no. Not too fast. We're going to experiment with having the 6'6 six, six monster Zion Williamson play five full time. And um, I'm not here to take a guess on whether it will work or won't work. But I will say, I guess two different things, uh, because y'all know I like to play both sides of the coin. That's what we do around here. Let me show you. Um, Zion Wilson has played some five in his career, a small amount of five, but five in his career nonetheless. Here are the stats. Last year, he played about 14% of his minutes at the five position. Well, uh, the team had a point differential of plus 10. They were an elite level defense in this time. And the offense was still pretty good. But the elite level defense was Zion played the five. Again, it's a small amount of of um of time just 14 percent of his time in his season last year but the year before that he played five percent of his minutes at center position as you can see there's this trend here except for we, we don't count we don't count this season right there's a trend here that as zion has played center throughout his career in this small amount of time the team has been really really effective so that's it right we just we just run the five man run him at the five and have a team collection rebound because of course whenever you go small the rebound is a big thing that's the good of it Small sample size, but Z at the five has spaced the teams out. They're hitting a bunch of threes. The defense is locking up and it's working out. But y'all know there, again, is two sides to every coin. And I can't help but to think about this and think about what the 2020 Houston Rockets team. Of course, different personnel, different coaching staffs, different everything other than them being really small. Where P.J. Washington or P.J. Tucker went into the playoffs, and y'all know that infamous graphic of 6'5 P.J. Tucker um, being, of course, the smallest center in the playoffs. Well, they're going to be doing something similar to this because Zion is 6'6". I don't know Brandon Ingram's taller than that, but still, the center position, if they run this way, is going to be... Tough. And there were a few different reasons why that Houston Rockets team didn't really work out. Um, and part of that was, was the rebound. When you buy in completely to running a small, small lineup, you're going to give up a bunch of boards. You're asking everybody to rebound by committee. And let's be honest, DeJounte Murray is a good rebounder for his position. Um, I would say Brandon Ingram is a good rebounder for his position. I know we're not saying this guy is starting. Trey Murray for the third is a good rebounder for his position. Zion took a step back when it comes to his rebound and stats last year, but I can recognize that Zion is a plus rebounder in his side. So they have plus rebounders around his roster, but it still makes it tougher to close out possessions. And there was a, let me see if I can find this game. There was a game where the Houston Rockets in this season where they were going ultra small ball played against the Lakers. And that was in the playoffs that year. And let's say it was game, it's this game, game four. And I actually remember reading an article about this. I'm gonna see if I can find it and link it in the description where this is them playing their small ball lineup. Where in this game, I mean, the, the stats don't look too bad. Russell Westbrook, 25 points. Good efficiency, 50% from the field. The team as a whole shot 42% from three, right? This looks like box score wise, even though they only scored 100 points, like nothing here is an outlier other than the fact that the LA Lakers ended up with 52 rebounds in this game, 12 of them being offensive. They lost the rebound battle time and time again. Let me see if I can find that article. Found it. Yes, yes, yes. So I'll, I'll link this article in the description because it gives analytics and, and gives uh, more in depth 
of why this team failed. But before the All-Star break, this is before they traded Clint Capella, they were middle of the pack when it comes to rebounding. Everybody is relatively close other than the Milwaukee Bucks being leagues ahead of everybody when it comes to rebounding. Then after that, they failed to the bottom three in the entire basketball. And the idea was, well, we're going to put up so many three-point shots that if the, if the other team gets an extra possession, so it won't matter because we're just going to outshoot you at the end of the day, the math won't matter. And that's not going to be, again, that's not going to be the identity of the Pelicans. They're not just going to run a five-out offense with Zion as a role man. That's not what they're going to do. But when you have a small lineup like this, you're really going to have to rebound at a whole different level. Everybody, You cannot take a possession off from the point guard to the center position when it comes to rebounding. And it's easier said than done. Oh, yeah, all of them dudes, they just going to crash. They just going to crash. It's so much harder to do that. Even in the stats that I showed you of the team being really good with Zion at the center, their defensive rebounding rate was 33%. That's the bottom 5% in basketball, right? So their defense was so very good, but they struggled with closing out possessions. On the opposite side of that, they didn't get offensive rebounds at all. They didn't get their own second possessions. And, you know, Zion is the king of getting a second possession. He'll miss a shot and get it back and go right back up. So... That is just the chance that you're trying to take, right? But this team has the shooters, right? With CJ McCollum evolve in his game or where last year was a catch and shoot guy. I mean, I think he was the second player in Pelicans history to hit 200 threes in a season other than, I think Trey Murphy was the first guy to do that last season. So CJ has evolved his game. Again, DeJounte Murray has evolved his game. Trey Murphy the third is one of those dudes that if you give him any amount of space, he will let it fly. And Herb Jones shot 41% from three. They have all of the shooting that you can need. They just have to get their volume up. And this is something I talked on the podcast about with Brandon Ingram, where um, one of my biggest criticisms, Brandon Ingram, though he's a phenomenal basketball player, is that he should be taking at least two more three-pointers a game. But instead, he'd rather put the ball on the floor and take an extra two mid-range jump shots. And he's efficient in those shots, right? So I guess it it's okay, but he's so much more efficient as a catch and shoot player that those shots that he put it on the floor, if he just let it fly, the team will just be better and he will be better. So this lineup of what I'm expecting to be of DeJounte Murray, TJ McCollum, uh, Herb Jones, Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson has the opportunity to run some teams off the court, but also they might struggle to get that rebounding and it might lead to some second chance opportunities and so on and so forth. Because even the centers that they have on the roster is like Daniel Tykes, who's an undersized defender. He's He's been quality a quality player throughout his career and everything, but he's an undersized center at that as well. Uh, one of my least favorite things, and this is not a Pelican thing, but it was also a thing with it's the thing with the Warriors right now or a thing with that Houston Rockets team to not have anybody ain't not a single body on the roster over seven feet it's just mind-blowing to me because even if that player is not in the rotation he could be a guy that could come in and provide something two minutes a game when you really needed to the the Warriors have run this way forever so I guess it's worked the Houston Rockets traded everybody that was over 6'6", that or 6'8", with uh, Robert Covington being there. That was mind-blowing to me, to not just have one dude, just in case, 14th man on the roster. You may never play, but we damn it, we need a Boban Marjanovic to stand in front of the passing guy to prevent them from getting an easy look. They don't have any of that, right? Eves Messi is a guy that might contribute his rookie season, but I think that's expecting a little bit too much. Even with them running small, it puts so much more pressure on Zion Williamson on both sides of the floor. Like when he was looked at to be a plus defender coming out of the draft, it wasn't about his one-on-one defense on the block or anything like that. He was just smarter, faster, and anticipated more than his college uh, uh, opponents, right? If you watch his moments back at college when he was making defensive plays, it's him just predicting that, that Kobe White is going to throw a pass and he just jumped the pass. It's him on the help side or the weak side coming in and blocking a shot jumping 17 feet in the air. And if he's playing full-time center position, you lose some of that, even though I guess we haven't seen a lot of that at the NBA level. You're just expecting him to do so much more defensively. And he already is taxed very heavily on the offensive side of the ball. I just don't love the idea of a guy who has had a lot of injury um, um, misfortune throughout his career to now have to do even more on both sides of the floor. Because again, you got to think about that def that defense, defensive center, the guy that's guarding the road, man, all of that is as important as any position in basketball. Now, I guess there is a world where you allow Herb Jones to be that guy, right? Herb Jones is the dude that's guarding these bigger players that might be in the pick and roll actions and so on and so forth. And then I guess you do allow DeJounte Murray to stay on the primary ball handler. I think Willie Green is probably going to mix around with it just a little bit. Um, but it, it's, it's a lot to ask for all of these dudes to be bought in every single possession, defensively and rebound. I know I say this pretty much about every team so far in this series. It's such an intriguing team, man. It's it's a, such an interesting team because this team won about 50 games last year 
with all of this, right? With with the the Brandon Ingram not shooting the ball from three, with him not having a space in because of Big Val, they still made it happen. And a lot of that was like they got laughed off the court in that Lakers game in the uh, end season tournament. And then um, then Zion decided he was like, okay, I I'm just gonna take over now. And he did for like a month straight, and it was a beautiful thing. So. Uh, the Pelicans should be one of those very interesting teams. If you told me that they stayed out of the play-in completely, I would believe you. But if you told me they were a play-in team again this season, I would believe you as well. I, I have no idea where to gauge this team. Uh, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and let me know what you think.